Hello and welcome to the Friday, September 8th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Well, and sadly, it looks like struts vulnerabilities are not going away. We do have a second vulnerability here in Apache struts. This vulnerability is also a remote code execution vulnerability, but it only affects fairly specific expressions. So if you're not using these particular constructs in your code, then you shouldn't have a problem. Of course, there will be a problem that you now have to fix out whether or not you're using these constructs in your code and that could make things a little bit more complicated. But well, the short answer is a patch and update to the yet latest and greatest version. That would be struts 2.5.12 and struts 2.3.34, depending on if you're on the 2.5 or 2.3 branch. At the same time, we are actually seeing exploit attempts against the earlier struts vulnerability. So that definitely has taken off after the Metasploit module was released. The exploit attempts that we have seen so far appear to be triggered by that Metasploit module. So individual attempts, no big kind of warm at this point, but we all know that's coming next and uh, that's probably going to show up within the next few days. Still, I'm seeing enough of these exploit attempts where I would say if you are running a somewhat higher profile website, someone probably already tried this particular exploit against your site. So again, before you update or as you update, make sure that your site hasn't already been compromised. And I usually don't cover a lot of breaches here because there are just too many of them, but uh, we do have one that's quite significant that was made public today and it affects the US credit bureau Equifax. Equifax apparently got compromised and with that information for 143 million US consumers was leaked. Now this is significant not just because of the scale of the breach but also because it does affect one of the credit rating agencies where people usually are being provided with free credit monitoring uh, if their data was leaked in just a such a breach. It's not really clear yet at this point how Equifax will react to this. There is some word out there that, well, you'll get free credit reporting with Equifax, which of course you may have gotten already because of a breach that you were subject to in the past. Intruders apparently had access to social security numbers, names, addresses, birth dates, driver license numbers, credit card numbers, essentially all the data that credit reporting agencies usually have access to. Their credit card numbers weren't really such a big deal here. Only 200,000 of those got leaked, probably from users who use credit cards to pay for services with Equifax during the time of the breach. In the end, I don't think that really substantially changes anything when it comes to these type of breaches. You should assume that your social security number, your birthday has already been leaked in one of these many prior breaches we had so far. If you're adding up all the breaches, essentially what you end up with is that every individual's data has been leaked at some point. Now this breach was announced after the stock market had closed in extended trading. The stock then fell 13% from its high today. Now on Wednesday, I talked about the MasterCard Internet Gateway Services flaw. Now in this particular case, there were problems in how these validation hashes were exactly calculated. Part of the issue also was a hash extension flaw, which uh, is actually quite common and often not quite well understood by developers. You're essentially at risk of uh, this particular vulnerability whenever you simply take a secret, concatenate it uh, with uh, whatever data you want to verify and then hash uh, the result. An attacker can just add appropriate padding and then append 
additional values to whatever data you're hashing here and still end up with a valid hash. Adrian has a great write-up about uh, this particular flaw and how to exploit it. So if you are dealing with this problem, take a look at uh, his diary for more details. Well, it's a Friday again, so I got with me another STI student. Matt Hosberg is here with me. Matt, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, well, good morning, Johannes. Uh, my name is Matt Hosberg. I'm a uh, cyber threat hunter for a company called Radian, who's based out of uh, Philadelphia, and they specialize in credit enhancement services such as mortgage insurance for home buyers. Uh, recent STI graduate student, so I just completed everything back in uh, July. And I'm very, very thankful to be done at this point. That sounds great. So now you have time for a lot of extra fun. And we'll talk a little bit about one of your research papers, which was sort of around the idea of threat hunting. And well, how do you sort of deception as part of this? Can you explain a little bit how this all fits together and what you talked about in your paper? Yeah, no problem. So the premise is, uh, is leveraging offensive countermeasures or active defense uh, for threat hunting. And um, I, I had two goals of, of the paper, the research. Uh, one was to show the kind of the human element of uh, threat hunting. And then uh, secondly, to uh, kind of show how uh, we can leverage that human element for uh, techniques uh, such as active defense. So active defense now, that of course, Hopefully, it doesn't mean that you're attacking back. Can you tell a bit how you used active defense and what this term really means? Yeah, so maybe to frame it up a little bit better, uh, active defense in the context of threat hunting. Um, so I focused on um, uh, basically there's three A's of active defense, and this is coined by John Strand and Paul Asadorian uh, in a book they wrote several years back. And they basically have three A's that are uh, annoyance, attribution, and attack. And for this research, I really honed in on the attribution act, uh, aspect. So really what I was looking at is how do we identify and uh, attribute uh, an attacker uh, more on an individual level? And so active defense uh, does have an attack ac aspect to it as well. Um, but again, I was just focused on the attribution uh, section. Can you give us an example on how you used active defense and how it worked for you? Yeah, so back to the human element, um, you know, we all are very, very familiar with uh, breaches and things that happen and, and massive data loss. And so one of my things I looked at were some of the, the, the very, very well-known uh, data loss, uh, um, I guess, incidents that have happened in the past. Uh, in particular, um, if you th uh, think back several years to uh, a case with Chelsea Manning, who was a uh, Army private in the, in the Army, uh, leaked... Uh, hundreds upon thousands of diplomatic cables and army reports. Um, and really the catalyst, I think, for uh, the Arab Spring and, and even some of the Occupy movements. Um, so I wanted to show that cascading effect uh, that those type of leaks had. But with the premise of trying to find out if there's a way we can decrease that detection delta to kind of find out if there are insiders or potential insiders present. And so what I did with the active defense uh, techniques with attribution is I leveraged a solution they have in there. It's uh, called the web bug server. And all it really is is a server that um, you can deploy on premise or in a cloud. And you essentially stage documents or emails with a very, very simple web bug so that when the, when the document is open um, or a uh, email is open, um, a, a callback is sent to that web bug server. And you can track things like the source IP address, uh, the, the document ID, you can trace back um, a user agent string to kind of help to confine or um, have, a, have a more succinct list of uh, potential insiders. Um, so what I would leverage is that first uh, stage is kind of casting a wide net. Um, so you could stage these documents within uh, you know, various uh, department shares uh, that might take a little effort to get to, um, so it's not completely obvious. Um, and then based on uh, any type of callback traffic you would see from it, um, you could you could kind of whittle a list down into a, uh, a more, uh, you know, definitive or potential list of insiders uh, with that, so. Now, this sounds like quite a bit of work, and I know that John Strand, you mentioned him, he came up with ADHD, the 
active defense harboring our distribution i think is what he's calling it uh did you mostly use open source tools like that for it or uh, what kind of tool set uh, helped you set this all up so so one of my favorite parts of doing this research was leveraging uh adhd uh and then also uh security onion and the beauty about these systems uh, not only can you set them up in a lab environment and and test out any type of configuration your mind can come up with. Um, there are also tools that are uh, um, they're free, uh, being open source, but you can also scale these up to maybe an enterprise level. Um, and so one of the things that I like to uh, always point out is a lot of my research uh, throughout you know, the course of the program, I leveraged Security Onion. Um, so big kudos to Doug Burks and his, his crew for uh, maintaining that. It's come a long way. Um, and so what I, what I really wanted to do with... Um, with all of this uh, threat hunting and, and web bug um, uh, callbacks was to pump that over into Security Onion. Uh, and then basically with the latest version of Security Onion, they, uh, they've they leveraged Elasticsearch and Kaibana. And so you can easily and rapidly kind of sh uh, uh, set up alerts and or uh, visualizations for, uh, for that data. So very, very cool. Uh, I guess things they're they're doing in that space, um, and very easy to uh, enable researchers like me to uh, uh, to do some work. So now, uh, once a promise of uh, this work uh, with deception and active defense is to reduce your false positive rate uh, because uh, you're no longer relying really on signatures per se, but you're actually relying on the attacker downloading that particular document. Did you find this true that uh, there were less false positives than you had with other methods and any false positives still left that you sort of had to weed out manually? Oh, sure. And and so um, taking a, maybe a half step back, so threat hunting in my mind is, is kind of... Um, it's it's the area where there may you may be doing uh, research or investigating things where there's not necessarily a definitive alert for, um, and so what what active defense combined with that threat hunting is we're really trying to minimize that false positive rate. And so what I found was um, the more documents that would be distributed, uh, the higher your your rate of false positives would be. Uh, however, if you would stage these documents uh, as you were casting that wide net um, into areas where uh, maybe just a curious user uh, opening that document um, wouldn't necessarily stumble on, this would take uh, maybe some effort or somebody who was actually looking for particular uh, documents or, or data within the organization. Now, with that uh, that wide net that was cast, uh, and you can kind of whittle the, the list down from that, I leveraged another tool called Mole Hunt, which is essentially a way to create a uh, unique web bug document per user. And so that in turn could be placed in an area maybe where that user only has access to. And so if that does get leaked um, or opened or whatever, you have a, a lower, lower false positive rate. So you can say, yeah, for sure we have a problem and we need to either set up additional monitoring, um, alert the SOC, um, or if we have, um, you know, some type of procedure around that, we can. Now, one thing, though, I, I would caution is is there's um, there's a couple things going on with uh, with the documents that are opened. Let's say you have a cloud-based system and you have a on-premise system. Um, if that document is opened and beacons back to a cloud-based system, you'll probably see the IP address of the organization. Now, if if which may not be an indicator you have an insider, it could just be somebody curious. Now, if you start to see that callback traffic with, let's say, a public IP address, that's a very high indication that that document has been leaked. And even if, let's say, you had a DLP system or some other monitoring in place, it could be another indicator that for sure somebody is uh, circumventing those systems somehow. Maybe they're... Um, uh, they're encoding it, maybe they're uh, exfiltrating it via uh, external media or something like that. So um, kind of a way to reduce or at least get mo more visibility into the documents that actually have left the organization. Now that sounds uh, really interesting. Now, given that uh, you're done with your decree at this point and have plenty of free time on your hand, I guess, after finishing all that work, uh, anything you're up to next? <laughs> it's it's funny you say free time. I, I don't know how uh, 
where all that free time goes, but it's like a vacuum. There's always a, it always gets filled. Um, I would say right now though, I'm, I'm working on refining our threat hunting program at Radian. Um, so I'll continue on that, but I'm going to probably dive more, uh, into the active defense realm and, and see where I can actually integrate that more with threat hunting. And, and I guess with all that in my spare time, I might actually, uh, uh, try to contribute to the ADHD project. I'm not sure. So that sounds great so thanks for your time here and thanks for joining us and thanks everybody for listening that's it for today talk to you again on monday bye okay i think that works well do you still have the link for the upload